You are listening to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast, where we are vigorously equipping men to pursue biblical manliness. This is our midweek, a quiet life podcast that focuses on living a quiet life, mind your own affairs, work with your hands, and be dependent upon nobody. For more information, visit us at thepursuitofmanliness.com. In Tribe each week, we have a challenge video. And the challenge is designed to get us to consider you know, where we are at as men, what season of life we're in, you know, our perspective, what the Lord's trying to teach us. And you get you know, a large group of guys answering this challenge video throughout the week, you're going to get a lot of fresh perspectives. And the challenge this week is, you know, what season are you in that you think God is preparing you for something else? And we talk about every week in this Quiet Life podcast that uh, you know, we aspire to live a quiet life. There's a preparedness that happens in the quiet life. When the quiet life is a biblical life, there's a preparedness. And what I mean is God is always preparing us for something. He's always getting us ready for that next season. You know, they used to say in athletics, I'm sure they still do, you know, what got you there won't keep you there, right? Like what got you to make the team isn't what's going to keep you on the team. You got to continue to work and, and, and put in more effort. And so there, there's a large aspect of that when it comes to the Christian life that we're continually growing and striving to be better and do more. And we're not trying to earn our salvation, but we say, man, I'm not going to cheapen it either. I'm going to make sure I get everything I can out of this life. Joshua chapter 5, verse 12, they the, and the manna ceased the day after they ate the produce of the land. This is the Israelites' first uh, Passover in Canaan. They ate all the goodness of the land, and God said, Okay, by the way, that manna source, that's over. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate the fruit of the land in Canaan that year. That's done. What got you to this place is not what's going to get you to continue to further, further down the road. And as I said, there's a preparedness, there's a quietness in that preparedness, right? And in particular, I want to talk about this today. We're talking about Joshua. God was preparing the Israelites, but more specifically, God was preparing Joshua really for what you see in Joshua chapter 6, which is the fall of Jericho. There's no military commander that would say that's a great strategy. There's no leader that would say, hey, makes sense to me, right? Like that's that's that point's been that drum's been beat ad nauseum, right? We've talked about that enough. I don't think the fall of Jericho is about leadership strategy as much as it is God going before his people, specifically in this case, Joshua, and preparing them decades before they ever get to that place. If you go all the way back, what is that? Numbers chapter 13, Joshua and Caleb, they're the two of the 12 spies that go in to spy out the land and say, oh, it is a good place. We need to go in there, and, and, and boy, God has given it to us. I mean, look at the fruit of this land. I mean, this is this is prime. This is like beachfront property, right? Like that is the place that I can't believe we're going to get to live there. I can't believe we're going to get to work there. I can't believe we're going to get to eat the food there. And if you remember correctly, the 10 spies that came back with them said, it's a terrible place. You don't want to be there. We look like, you know, just insects compared to them. They're going to kill us. They're going to wipe us out. And the people revolted against Moses, revolted against Joshua and Caleb's positive message, and they wanted to stone him. They wanted to kill him. God says, fair enough. How about four decades just wandering around for a while? How about, how about this? Why don't we wait until all the generation that you're convinced that, it, that I'm just bringing you in to die? How about, why don't we just wait until that generation dies? And then none of you, except for Joshua and Caleb, will get to experience the promised land. All the things that you're worried about, that next generation, they'll get to experience that. So here's Joshua and Caleb for the next 30, 40 years walking around, and, and people got to be giving the stink eye. I wonder how many conversations they had about that. So tell me, what was it really like over there? Do you really think we could have lived there? Do you really think God was doing it? I mean, for, you think that this conversation had to continually come up, and i got to believe there are times when Joshua and Caleb are laying in their bed at night, staring at the ceiling, going, why did we not say more? Why did we not do more? You ever had that in your life? You look back and think, why did I not do more? Why did I not say more? Why did I not take more risk? Why did I not enjoy that more? Why did I not pursue that more. I, I, I imagine they were, but as you know, God's, God's certainly not done with them. 
You see Joshua with Moses, learning from his leadership. Moses, for all of his flaws, was an incredible leader when it came for interceding on behalf of his people. I've served in church for church professional, like as far as being on staff for about 20 years now. And I've seen some people do some really jerky, mean, disrespectful things to a pastor, their family sometimes, uh, to the church. I've had people say some really uh, not nice things about myself, even recently. And uh, boy, I'll tell you what, it would be hard for me I'm just being honest with you. It'd be hard for me to lay prostrate on my face and just and just ask for God's mercy on those individuals. I mean, just pleading their case before God. Um, I don't do that well. And some of you guys listening to this or watching this, you've been pretty crummy to your pastor before. Do you think he's praying for you? I hope he is. Uh, because if he's not, I don't know who is. But here's Moses praying for the people of Israel. I got to imagine there's times where Joshua asked Moses, why are you doing that? And I got to believe Moses is going to look at Joshua and say, I'm praying for you too, brother. Okay, this ain't just they're bad, we're good. I think he's praying for the whole assembly and Moses continually intercedes on behalf of the nation of Israel. I got to believe that Joshua is going to, he's going to learn from that. You have all these different things where uh, again, the fallout from the report to Moses praying for the people, uh, Moses getting frustrated about their complaining about food and about water and all that, and you know, smacking the rock a couple times, and God telling Moses, "Man, you're you're not going in. You're not going to be going in there." And so here's Joshua learning from Moses in this this quiet preparedness. What is God quietly preparing in you? And I say quietly because I think sometimes we, when something happens in our life or something we get excited about or something we're, we're inspired by, we feel like we got to broadcast it to the world. I've shared with you guys before, and I didn't share what it was. There have been times in my life that I have felt like specifically the Holy Spirit has told me, that is just for you. I did that just for you. I, you had that experience just for you. That ain't a podcast topic. That's not a social media post. That's not something to text to all your, your friends. No, that was just for you. So in the quietness of your heart, just consider that, God, what are you preparing for me to do? The easy answer would be, well, nothing. No, he's doing something. And if we don't think there's something, then we need to find, figure out, okay, what's going on here? So once Moses dies... Joshua is now in charge. He's now going to lead the nation of Israel. Now, you're probably not going to lead the nation of Israel, but I don't know about you, but I have found myself in a place where suddenly I'm no longer in the younger circle. I was just talking to our staff about this today, and I am more than okay with that. I'm actually glad I'm not in that quote-unquote younger circle. I think it gave me an excuse, whether it was deliberate or not, to not be that responsible or to make a lot of excuses or to do some things in a ridiculous way. Well, now I feel like I'm getting to an age where I see things a little different. That doesn't mean I'm better. It just means I'm seeing them different. And I think Joshua gets to an age where God says, now you start to see some things different. That older generation, they're gone. You're up. Look, man, if it's just you and I and this older generation before us who has fought for the things that matter the most, who took a stand on conviction when it came to the Word of God, who took a stand on morality, who took a stand on marriage, who took a stand on raising your children, who took a stand on going to work and paying their bills, who took a stand on taking care of your property, who took a stand on being responsible, who took a stand on being faithful and knowing that they would show up well, when they're gone, who fills their shoes? I know in our church, we've had some older people pass away and nobody's filled their shoes. There's a vacancy. So they labored all these years and everybody around them took the good of what they did, but nobody picked up the baton and ran with it. I think that's a tragic, tragic way to live your life for the generation that follows. I don't want to be the guy that drops the baton. I don't want to be the guy they say, well, when he came along, 
the whole thing unraveled. When he came along, he just watched. When he came along, he just critiqued. When he came along, all he did was get worked up over things that weren't kingdom-minded. All he did was you know, post about this or do this. I don't want to be that guy, man. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that guy. I got enough things I'm concerned about in my own life. I don't want to be the guy who actually makes it worse or doesn't want to grow up. Joshua's at a place where he's going to be doing some growing up. And so now he's going to lead the people into the promised land. I find it very funny that the people said, just like we listen to Moses, we'll listen to you. I, I would, if I was Joshua, I'd call time out and say, don't do it that way. Do it different because you didn't listen to Moses. You didn't listen to God. All you did was grumble and complain the whole time. Well, guess what Joshua gets? A bunch of people who are probably going to be doing the same thing. And so here's Joshua in this quiet, these quiet moments that we don't even read about. I mean, and if you want to take this to another level, then you look at Caleb. Caleb is almost the forgotten guy once you get in the promised land until he goes up and says, by the way, I, need, I want my inheritance. I have as much vigor as I did 30, 40 years ago. But I think God was preparing something very unique in Joshua in those quiet moments that we don't read about. We don't get a ton of from Joshua's preparation, except for with Moses, now you're leading the nation of Israel. And then you have this Jericho moment. Joshua chapter 6, they go into Jericho and they march around and they're shouting for the Lord. And, 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 and what, did, what, did, what did Joshua do different than, than Moses? He learned something here. So when he sent the spies in to check out the land, he did it, he did it secretly, didn't he? So when he went in, they went in and they talked to, uh, they talked to Rahab, but they, Joshua didn't announce, hey, we're sending a bunch of spies. You know why he did that? He learned his lesson. He said, if they come back and they give a report that it's good, whatever, and, and one of them defects from the group and says, but by the way, it's scary and it's overwhelming, it's intimidating. You know what the generation before us did? They didn't try to scare us. They tried to grow us. The generation before us tried to mature us, to say, oh, don't be running around on your wife. Hey, make sure you're saving some money. Hey, pay your bills. You know what? Go to work every single day. You know what? Find a church, get involved, get invested. I mean, the generation before us, they had flaws just like we do, but they tried to model stability. They tried to model responsibility. I don't know if we've picked up that baton. And so we need to learn from the people that have come before us. But then God is going to do something unique in you and I that didn't look like the generation before us. But I believe it's better. Because what, Josh, what God does through Joshua is better than what he had going on with the Israelites wandering the desert floor. He says, I'm giving you the promised land. I'm giving you what I had promised four decades earlier. I'm giving it to you. You're going to get to live there, eat there, work there. I mean, you're going to reap the benefits of a land that you didn't even labor for. I mean, they're going to have to work and they're going to be a mess. Could God be preparing you for a Jericho moment? Now, I don't think it's going to look like a literal city that you're going to march around and take. I don't believe that at all. What I'm asking is, is God preparing you for something bigger in your life right now than you can even see with your own two eyes? Maybe something bigger that you're not announcing to the whole world. Could God be preparing you for something better than what you got going on right now? I don't think it's going to get worse. When I look at Scripture, what God does in people never gets worse. It gets better when they surrender to Him and they obey Him and they walk in His statutes and commands and instructions. I mean, it always gets better. It doesn't get easier but it gets better. The rewards are far greater. Now, the opposite of that is true as well. The destruction is far worse when they fail. So in this quiet preparedness that we keep talking about, this quiet life idea, is God stirring something in you that's new? I mean, it's something that you're like, I feel it. I think it. I mean, I, this is not wishful thinking. This isn't like pulling the lever and getting something from the, the God prize vault or a, a Christmas wish list. I'm saying that needs to be our prayer. God, would you quietly prepare me for something so that when I get to a Jericho moment, oh, Joshua is there 
four decades of, of, of life and leadership and instruction and uh, wins and losses, four decades for that one moment. For how long have you been on this planet? Could God have been preparing you for four decades for something far greater than what you can ask or imagine right now? Now, after you get through Jericho, wouldn't it be great if they lived happily ever after? Well, they didn't. They have the fall. Of, they have the problem with AI. You got ache and sin. You're going to continue to go through this where it's it's like it doesn't get easier, but it will get better. I think it was that Joshua lived 110 years. I don't know if you and I are getting 110 years, but wouldn't it be great if it could be said about us? And that that guy walked with the Lord. He had some incredible battles in his life. He trusted, he trusted that God would lead him and guide him and go before him. And he modeled all the things that the generation after him should, should follow in. That's what Joshua did. He tried to model all the things that he wanted the generation after him to follow in because he saw what Moses did. He saw what happened there. He saw Moses' prayers. I think Joshua probably prayed emphatically for the people of, of the Lord because he saw Moses do it. He learned from the experience in life and he allowed God to write a better story. I want you to think about that. What is God quietly preparing in you? Quietly stirring in you. And if your first inclination is, I'm not sure. You know, when I watch the challenge video for the week and I make the challenge video, so it's but I don't know my answers when I make the videos. When I made the video was several weeks ago and I watched it, it was Monday, I don't have my answer. I, I don't exactly know. I think I might know, but I don't feel confident enough to verbalize it yet. So I haven't made my challenge video yet. Maybe by the time this thing airs, I will, but it takes some time. It'll take some time, but my, I will say this. I'm expecting God to do something pretty remarkable. And to expect God to do something pretty remarkable, I'm never going to be able to earn it, but I am going to walk in His truth. I am going to do my best to obey what Scripture says. I'm going to do my best to be a sound man of God. I'm going to do my best to model characteristics and behaviors and, and, and aspects of responsibility that I want my kids, my future daughter-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, son-in-laws, that I want them to model. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do my best to model that because someday, I think there will be a Jericho moment. Now, I don't think there's just one moment. I don't think there's just one. That wasn't the only battle Joshua faced, was it? It was a big one. It gets a lot of publicity. It's pretty popular, but it wasn't his only battle. You'll probably have some battles. You'll probably have some things that are more popular than others, that are more visible than others. But you know every day there's these small little battles. Every day there's these small little victories that you're trying to pursue. And I think that's what happened with Joshua. Every day for at least 40 years, he conquered those smaller battles. So when he got to that place, God wasn't like, okay, now I need to load you up with a whole bunch of skill. He's like, no, you already got it. How'd you get it? You've been doing it for four decades. So Joshua was more equipped to lead the nation of Israel than even he realized. And I think that's true with you and I. We're more equipped to be men of God, to be disciple makers, to evangelize people who don't know Jesus. We're far more equipped than we will ever, we will ever admit or recognize. God knows what we know. He'll bring it to memory. I want to encourage you with that. In that quiet preparation, Joshua was being prepared and equipped for a Jericho moment. Perhaps you and I have some Jericho moments in our future. Today is a day for preparation. Today is a day for growth. Amen? Think about that. Take a look at Joshua chapter 5, Joshua chapter 6. Amen? I'll talk to you in a little bit. Thank you for listening to the Pursuit of Manliness podcast. If you would, make sure to visit iTunes and leave a five-star review to let others know what you think of this show. When you get a chance, make sure to visit thepursuitofmanliness.com to see what is available in the gear store, find more information out about Tribe, and much more. Thanks for listening, and let's keep pursuing biblical manliness. Manliness.